Good evening and welcome back to the shop. It's great to have you here and uh, stopping in the shop. I was just earlier saying um, how great it was to have a shop full of enthusiastic um, audience members here, which is pretty weird, but we got through it and had a blast. We actually had an unbelievable weekend last weekend. It was uh, our first of three epic weekends this fall. And we had uh, 20 people here and went through some great times together here in the shop, some seminars. We had special guests of David Lamb and Tim Coleman and a field trip to the uh, Shaker Village and lots of great food and fellowship amongst everybody. So, man, it was, uh, I, I guess we were so like caught up in it and too close to it that it was hard to evaluate. But everyone seemed to have a really good time. <laughs> so, uh, so we're excited for the next one. By the way, if you wanna be part of that, we do have a couple spots open for the September epic weekend so you can go on our website and check that out if you want to actually be right in here for one of these shop night lives and then a great weekend together all right That's great well also if you like this content go ahead and like share and subscribe Did i say that fast like enough? share and subscribe yes <laughs> and uh, all the good stuff but um and Especially if you want to go deeper with us, you can go to our website at epicwoodworking.com for all the insider news. All right, well, tonight, I've been thinking about this for a long time, but I've, lately I've been developing new projects for, to come out pretty soon for us to have available for you to make and build. So tonight, I'm actually working out the final kind of designs and little elements of a hanging cabinet. So this could be a utility cabinet or whatever you would prefer to use it for. Now, you might remember a few weeks ago, we did a, an episode of Shop Night Live on making a Cooper door, a curved front door. And we've talked in the past about laminating curved doors, but, uh, Tonight, I want to make the actual cabinet. We've never really made the cabinet behind the doors. <laughs> and so I wanted to show you the approach I wanted to make for making a hanging cabinet. Now, this is a lot like the one that I did some time ago on the classic woodworking, if you guys caught that episode on uh, public television. But I am doing this one, uh, trying to simplify it a little bit and maybe even have two options. But you know, I need your help. See, when I try to figure out these final details, I want to hear from you. I want to hear your ideas and your input. Not that I'm going to pay attention to any of it, but I just, <laughs> sorry. I actually, no, I seriously, I, I do. Be honest. <laughs> that's what you say, right? I, that's how I handle uh, our conversations. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we wonder. Uh, but anyway, I am going to get into it. But I, one of the, the great cabinet makers, studio furniture makers in recent history that I've talked about many times is James Krenoff. Now, it was really fun to have Tim Coleman here as part of the Epic Weekend because he knew James, or he told us that he preferred to be called Jim. So from now on, <laughs> Jim Krenoff. Uh, and he had a lot of a great experience there in the shop with him. But I remember reading this book when I was, before I got in full-time woodworking, a cabinet maker's notebook. He wrote several very influential, almost poetic books. I don't know why they grab a hold of you the way they do, because when you read them again years later, it's like, it's still good, but it's almost like stream of consciousness, but there's something about it that's really cool. Um, but 
He has black and white photos. Um, I'm trying to remember if there's any color, but mostly black and white photos in this book. And it's what captured me in it was all the sweet little details and attention to the uh, the details in a way that you could tell a hand tool had been there. Like the warmth and the beauty and the subtlety about all of his work. It just pushes it to a higher level. Like each piece has like a little personality to it. You know, it's so much different than just something that's straight cut off the saw. So this is a great one to pick up if you want to be inspired in your woodworking journey, especially if you're starting out. Just beware you may get caught up in the romance of it and think that woodworking is a great career. <laughs> it is. Not that it can't be, but it's not an easy road. And the beaten down look in Jim's face in many of these photos attests to that. <laughs> no, actually, <clears throat> it's a great road, especially when you get to share it with friends. Yes. But in your later career. But one of the things that I really was taken by in the book are his treatment of hanging cabinets. So I went to this when I was designing initial cabinet and you know, he's got these, this I believe is pear wood. He used pear wood a lot um, in some of these earlier pieces. Oh, this one's in maple. Okay, wow, maple. So here's a hanging cabinet. It's got uh, a very subtle curved front. A lot of his cabinets did. Many of his doors he made from solid panels, uh, just two solid panels glued up. So there'd be a glue joint here and you have pretty much, wait, is that right? I don't wanna lie. Maybe not. Maybe that's not a glue joint. Maybe that's a, a singular plank actually. And he would shape the curve right out of a singular plank and then he has a very plain, kind of simple, clean look to it. You've got a top and the bottom, and that serves as the bottom edge of the drawer. There's no like frame, there's no excessive molding or additional molding or crown on there, but that's the bottom, and then you can see it's dovetailed into the sides there. And then let's take a peek at another one. Here's the one that was more of an influence for the one I made. Now, you don't see the front of this one, but you can see that that's solid doors. He's got three doors, three boards glued up. It's solid boards. And he would hand plane and sculpt that thing into a nice curved shape. But inside, it's, this is a smaller one. He does have an added crown on this one. And you can see the photo over here, the detail, the little knife hinge. In the corner nicely softened and he probably he probably cut that cove somehow with a hand plane I don't know and then this one <coughs> another cabinet but man is that long and thin or what <laughs> I think it's for a broom or something <laughs> what would you guess something special that someone needed yeah like, he made uh, it for them special yeah, I mean, that. what does he say? Oh, it's all in centimeters, so. Anyway, the height is 78 centimeters. The width is 20 centimeters. Oh, maybe that's not that big. That's pretty tiny, right? Um, yeah, that's pretty small. So this is a very small box. <laughs> maybe it's for <laughs> something like a pipe. Well, he did have a, a shot in here, and I think I lost the bookmark, where he made a pipe cabinet hanging pipe cabinet and uh, oh here's a photo of of Jim in his younger day just thoughtfully tuning his plane which he made of course hmm. and in here he talks about how he especially liked his planes and making his planes and he he thought of them almost as the violins of the workshop you know like as to an orchestra they kind of set the tone and they just cut through and just have this pour this beautiful sense over the whole environment mm -hmm. well let me show you the the cabinet really quick this is not glued up but this is something of my version of a crane off 
cabinet that I made some time ago. And this is in ash. And we've got a door. Look at that. Nice and subtly curved. A lot like the one I showed you the first one. So the top makes up the top frame, like kind of frames the door, top and bottom. It's got a nice subtle curve and no crown molding, no additional piece. So it's just basically a box. It's the top and bottom in your sides, but the sides are set back from the top and bottom to allow for the door to set into that space and then allowing the, the uh, top panel, it, it, I almost said crown molding, but it is like a top molding now. It doubles for the molding because it's got a slight round over and it's about 3 16 proud. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, when I built this, I thought a lot about how to make the corner. I didn't like the fact that if you just cut the dovetails flat to the side like he did in that one, it just felt like this molding got truncated or cut off, you know, too, too harshly. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have it appear to wrap the side? And that was possible by just making these dovetails, these pins, proud by the same overhang as in the front. So I've got about a 3 16 overhang here and I shaped it, curved, curved it to make the appearance of a molding when you're looking at it straight on. But then you get kind of this nice look at these dovetails from the side. It gives them a whole another dimension and then these pins are softly rounded to look nice. So it's like, kind of like a, a craftsman piece in that sense where the, the um, joinery is, is pronounced and really makes, makes an impact visually on the piece. So instead of the sides being boring, you have a little more action going on. But from the front, it's very Cronovian, wouldn't you say? Oh, I like that. All right, so this, this door is all laminated and I may do that and I kind of want to hear your thoughts like what, what you're into, but um, let me show you another one. This was a door that I made not long ago. We made a frame and panel on Shop Night Live. So if you want to see this, uh, it's just a few episodes ago, I believe. And I made it to fit into the opening just to see how that would look. Now, now this top and bottom is curved. I guess you could leave that. It doesn't actually look half bad like that, you know? But um, this is a more traditional um, raised panel in a mortise and tenon frame, which we put together during that episode. So you can go back and check that out if you like this door. Now, um, thank you for suggesting, somebody suggested, hey, if you want a topic for Shop Night Live, you should build a cabinet around your door. I think it was you, Steve. I think it was you. But I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to uh, nail that down. But thank you. And uh, go ahead and build a cabinet around there, and then you have some shop ca uh, cabinets, and that's a pretty good idea. But um, so that's what I'm doing while I'm testing out ideas for the final version. So we could have a version of our hanging cabinet using the traditional raised panel door. Uh, now, the third version that we could also use is also a curved door, but it's the Cooper door. So sort of like Cranoff's, like, uh, well, very similar. That one cabinet I showed you that had the three boards, that's a Cooper door with only three boards. Here, on this episode, we did several weeks ago, Shop Night Live. That was really popular. I'm not sure what mm -hmm. people are into Coopering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's up with that? Mm -hmm. Does anyone know why that was popular? Uh, but I guess it's just a cool technique, and it was pretty easy, and I did it without any special clamps. If you recall, it was green tape. <laughs> that taped and glued this up. But that's another good one. But this one has a stronger curve and it still has a faceted feel to the front, which needs to be knocked down and radiused 
better on the front and the inside, if you like. You could leave it just like this. No, there's no problem with that, but I can't really set it in here because it's too big, but it's too tall. But you can kind of see how it would look. Let me put it up here. So you can see that the curve is more pronounced than our previous curve. So what this will do is the cabinet will have to be made with a larger overhang here and then the front edge will get sawn to whatever radius we have here, adding on the molding. So we'll have a nice little uh, subtle round over like this atop it and that I think that's going to even feel more like a crane off piece because of the clean lines and the natural solid wood nature of everything okay so I have a couple questions then. sure okay is that ash on the sides Nate's asking yes it is Nate okay and Steve's asking how you rounded the pins Oh, I'm going to show that in a little while if, if we get through it. But I think we will get through it. I actually use a hand plane and files. Okay, Michael says, if the Cooper door were to be covered with veneer, would the limited movement telegraph through the veneer? Who said that? Michael. Michael, Michael, that's a, that's a really good question. Now, that, it's hard to know sometimes, but a lot of it has to do with the nature of the wood itself. So... This is all quarter sawn white pine. So uh, I'm going to talk in a second about how I made that. But this is um, extremely stable. We've mentioned this a few times that white pine is the most stable species in our country. I would say I almost said North America. I believe it's North America. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but it might be North America. And it's kind of weird that it is because you think of a soft wood like this, maybe it would be more spongy more expanding and contracting with seasonal movement and, and moisture as it changes from humid to dry seasons. But it's not. It is the most stable wood. It stays how you want it. And it's soft and, and it's fairly light. So when you cut it in the quarter sawn orientation like this, you can tell by the end grain, all perpendicular to the surface. Look at that. All seven pieces, beautifully quarter sawn. And then you know on the face, you're going to see that linear striping of all the different growth rings coming down. So you have this really kind of uniform front. Now, this would be an excellent substrate for veneering over the top. You could veneer over the top of this and it would hold it. It wouldn't, this wouldn't telegraph because you don't have anything really going on there. Um, usually when you veneer, you want to go across the grain with the next layer on both sides and then the finish if it would be vertical like that, okay? So this door, this door is veneered as well, but the substrate, the core, is not solid wood. It's, it's a built up layers of eighth inch bending ply. So that's another way. This is definitely gonna have no issues because it's plywood all the way through. But here you would be making almost your own plywood with a solid core lumber kind of core plywood. So you're just going to put your veneer over. And if you had plain sawn something like maple or something like that, which moves a lot, and it was plain sawn, then I'd be nervous. You know, so it's, it's all in the species and how the grain is oriented and all that. Uh, of the comments <coughs> I'm getting, the Cooper door seems to be the most popular. Okay, good. What if we had, here's another little question you can be thinking about while I move on. What if we had the Cooper door, because it's kind of a small project, maybe in the same plans, you could have a second option. Would you want the option for making it as a laminate and stay with the curve? Or would you want a flat option where maybe you have a raised panel door? You can't have them all, all three though, don't so much. <laughs> they only get so much on the paper. All right. So that's great though. I, I've, I love that. I, I want to get a true crinoff, off and that's really the way to go. So. He likes it just like that. No covering with. What? Anything. Lee says keep the Cooper door as it is. 
give us a more handmade look. Yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. I mean, for this, I, I that's why I, I, the whole reason for making it like this was for that. Now, I'm going to just show you really quick how I got that because I had to prep some more material for the uh, box, basically, that we're going to build. And I had to prep it. I wanted to do it all out of pine, again, kind of as an exercise just to see how it work. And pine's a lot of fun to work with. And you'll see why as we go through this. It's fast and easy, and it's very enjoyable to work. It's highly recommend that if you want to build something without a lot of stress, and it's like a mock-up, if you could use white pine, really good. Now, I know you don't all live near White Pine City, right? <laughs> but we happen to be blessed with a lot of white pine in this region of the country up in the Northeast and north of here, there's lots more. Um, but hopefully if you can't find it where you are, um, then go for the next best thing. Use something soft though. If you use softer wood when you're mocking up something, you don't fight all the joinery the same way. And plus, usually it's cheaper. Okay, so you can not work with as much stress and go for it that way. But, oh, that's one other question I want to ask you um, to also suggest, what kind of wood would you like the coarse cabinet to be made in? Do you like the white pine? I like the white pine, but, you know, we could do it out of something fancier if we wanted to. But um, pretty nice to use that. Uh, but let me show you how I made that material just really quickly I looks like you might be doing three options Tom <laughs> no 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 <laughs> no 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 okay so here you go here's the uh, here's a plank of white pine that I got from our good friends at Goose Bay who don't actually sponsor but they're good friends yes. and they give us wood for projects a lot of times and we're happy to send people their way but they do have amazing white pine in all dimensions and this is a chunk I got from a three inches thick and it was in the shorts bin sort of they have a short area so anyway it was much wider and I actually resawed it. I well, I I ripped it. I didn't resaw it. Resawing is technically changing the the thickness of it. Here I ripped it into short, narrower strips. So you see what happens when you do that, and then you turn that piece on its side. You've got all that quarter sawn grain, which is the way I made that Cooper door. Except I used eight quarter material, not twelve. This is twelve quarter in the rough. Okay, it's just 12 quarters, just fancy way of saying. It's still rough and a little more than three inches, okay? Okay, so you end up with a piece. Well, this is one of the pieces that I ripped off and I still have it like this. Um, so you can see the end grain is quarter sawn. You got this nice stable linear grain and you can control wood like that. A lot of times I'll do that if I want a plank, if I want quarter sawn wood and I don't care to have glued up edges, you can buy a quarter or 12 quarter. Usually that's going to be flat sawn and then you just rip it into boards and there you go. You got a whole bunch of quarter sawn beauties, right? So then, uh, what we once we have that we have to decide if we want to glue this up to width like this isn't wide enough for the sides of my cabinet i'm not making a terribly deep cabinet to start with you can make it as ever deep as you want but i like it shallow for about about uh three and a half four inches deep because the cabinets i'm making for us they're going to go in our bathroom <laughs> one on the right one on the left in the pine right so kind of nice to open and you don't need a lot of depth for the shaving cream and the toothpaste it's just like not a lot of need there so uh, plus you don't really want these kind of cabinets really heavy off the wall so anyway that's the way we're going but here I am I've got this piece and then I want to glue it up to width so I got to decide how do I want to glue it up so I could swim around now see see this edge how it has that nice kind of comb material there. Uh, I could swing it around and get a match 
pretty cool how that disappears. That's what's great about quarter sawn wood is that the glue joints just melt right away because everything's in linear. And like, look at, if we put a glue joint there, would you see that? Probably not. So this is what I'm showing you here when you come around with the board like this is called a come around with the board like this joint. <laughs> Actually, I don't know the true word, but this method when you slip one board down along the side is a slip Nothing. joint. What'd you call it? Slip match? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't say that confidently enough. That would have been great. Because you started saying joint and I stopped. No, it's a slip match is, is oh, okay. the same too. Yeah. Slip joint, slip match. <laughs> or come around like this joint. So I could slip it to that side or this side. Now you don't get as good a grain match, but usually you don't get it's more invisible in some ways because the grain orientation doesn't change across the glue joint, which can get weird. But for this, where it's right straight up on the side, I think coming around would be fine and everything would be happy and good. All right, so that's what I did. I already glued up one. Here's how they are when you glue them up. Uh, this is for my extra one. I've got a little bit of beads of glue there. I like to get those off before they harden. Hey, can you talk about the difference between poplar and pine? Uh, yeah, poplar Poplar is actually a good word. It's actually quite popular around this area. <laughs> Sorry, that was really oh, bad. Oh, gosh. Ta -dun -dun. A, Ta -dun -dun. Little, a little dad joke for it. Or is that a granddad joke? <laughs> Don't linger there. Keep going. Okay, so poplar. Okay. Any other, any other um, good uses of the word poplar I'd like to hear chimed in? I need some more material. But poplar, obviously, poplar is uh, a little harder than white pine. It's, it's a great paint wood. It's often used, um, exchanged for what's called secondary wood on furniture in the Northeast, because the secondary wood is usually less expensive, easy to work, a little lighter material that's found on the inside of cabinets. So drawer sides and the backs and the bottoms, that all be secondary wood. So in the recent chest of drawers we built, we used white pine as our secondary wood throughout. But many times, the 12 year walnut chest, I use poplar for that. It was excellent. So poplar is a great wood choice and it's wonderfully paintable and but it's not as stable. I, I'm, I can't punch up, I can't remember how what the numbers are, but you can look at the seasonal movement chart or whatever and uh, and you'll see the difference in that ratio. Is sugar pine as stable? Kit's asking. Sugar pine? Sugar pine as stable as the white pine? I'm not sure. I, you know what, I, I'm not sure what species sugar pine is. I don't know all the different pine relationships, like which one. That might be a short name for another type of pine. So somebody help me with that. I, I need to know. Is sugar pine, what is the species name for sugar pine? Maybe that's it. And is it as stable as white pine? All right, so I am gonna pull this, just a little of that glue off. Usually I do it right on the deck. I did glue this up. Um, and there you go. So I glue that up. I was gonna show you I glue it up one, but if you really want that, I'll do it after. But um, I think... I see you do a lot of gluing. What's that? I see you do a lot of gluing. Yeah, so see, this is gluing up for my, let's see, what did I say? Oh, for the sides of my curved version. So the first one I'm doing is going to be more for the flat front version, but uh, this is going to be sides for the curved version. So I'm gluing up three together. Look how that joint just totally melts away. It's so hard to see, right, where those joints are because it's quarter saw. And I would just glue and clamp that up, and I would end up with something like this. So this is going to be the two, the top and the bottom for my curved one. <coughs> and there, there you go. Now what's really nice about working with white pine is how beautifully it hand planes. So 
I don't like sanding it a lot because it tends to gum up the paper, especially if it's pitchy, but this isn't too bad. And uh, rather than sanding it, if you've got your hand plane tuned up, you can just skim over this and you're done. You do a little light sanding at the end, but you're done. Let me just show you how that goes really fast. Um, <coughs> Tom Jonathan says sugar pine is in the white pine family. It's very close to Eastern white pine and its properties. Oh, well, that, there you go. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, so that means it's, it's a gray wood to use very similar. So anyway, here, here's the way I, I go about it. I just get it into the, the end of the bench. It's just my dogs. And is Type Bond 3 good for bathroom? Uh, type Bond 3 is waterproof, so it would probably be fine for the bathroom, you know. Um, you could also paint, you know, we were talking about that on the we Epic Weekend, that the Shakers painted a lot of their furniture, a lot of it. And a lot of it was built in white pine. And they would just paint it like bright colors. Uh, so you could paint it, but maybe you'd feel like that's a sacrilege after you've exposed all that quarter sawn joinery and all, <laughs> all that quarter sawn <laughs> grain and beautiful joinery. All right, so if you want to see how you're doing when you're playing, you could just scribble down the body of the piece. And then I'll just take me number seven and start at the side. And I'm just going to go and overlap. Listen to that violin, as Jim would say. Mm. Setting the tone. Tony's in Florida with lots of cypress. Uh, oh, yeah. What do you think about that? Um, cypress, I wish I had some. Like, we, we, when I built the Adirondack chair, we couldn't, nobody up here had cypress, but uh, I did one out of it, and then they stopped carrying it. So, um, you know, I'm not sure how much that moves. It's kind of like a, it's got, a, you can almost feel the oils in it. It's awesome for exterior furniture. I, I loved working with it. It is a soft wood, but it's really sweet to work with. I wouldn't hesitate to use Cypress. It's got a really strong stripey pattern too when you do the, uh, when you rip, rip the board, like a plain sawn plank that's eight quarter. Just rip that and you will be have a very similar effect, but even more enhanced because of how strong the, the growth rings are. I'm not sure how much it moves though seasonally. You'd have to check that. Somebody could check that. All right, so there we got the other side. Look at this, no sanding, no, no loud noises. If you're wondering, we did a video on tuning and using a hand plane. To do this on surfaces so you can check that one out that's available free on YouTube there you go so that's it one skim across both surface and it feels glassy it's smooth it's so friendly to plane and that's what's beautiful about it now I just joint the edge and I rip my pieces to width and let me show you what I got here bring my pieces over here So I decided I liked the dovetail, like you can join that corner up in your cabinet, you know, a number of ways. We could, you know, Cranoff didn't always use uh, dovetails. There are some pictures in that book even where he's got dowel joints. He has a bunch of dowels sticking in there. And I mean, that's not great, but... It'll work on a cabinet. You can use dominoes, a little more modern kind of floating tenon method. Uh, you could miter it, a locking type miter, a spline miter. You could put screws in a butt joint. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but I'm going to go with definitely with the dovetail because I love just not only the appearance of it, but the mechanics of it. Like when you pick this up, this is not glued up. This is, those dovetails are pulling or resisting in the direction against the top and bottom coming apart. So that's perfect for something that's going to hang on the wall. You don't want it to come apart top to bottom. So once the glue is in there, this is, 
it's like it's like that chest of drawers you know a 200 year old chest there's no reason why the way this is constructed it wouldn't last for 200 years just think of the investment <laughs> in the time. And you can knock these dovetails out. And I'm gonna show you a method that I use, and some of you have seen this, but it's so fun and quick and easy that I'm gonna show you one corner on, using, on cutting dovetails like this using a hybrid method with a machine and by hand. So let me show you the sides. I've got some of the corners already kind of chopped out here. But here's one of my sides. Um, I made it, how long did I make it? 22 inches long. You know, I was, I was reading about the golden ratio or the golden mean, you know, uh, what people talk about being the perfect ratio uh, found in nature in many cases. Um, it's just a, like the perfect kind of rectangle, like, a lot of the nautilus shells and all that they just exhibit it the the center of a of a sunflower the way the seeds spiral out everything is there's so much that is related to this kind of um, ratio or mean in in space so um you could lock yourself in and say i want to definitely use the government it's the only way well obviously Jim Krenoff didn't care. <laughs> he had that super long, weird <laughs> cabinet. But what was interesting in measuring this door, I, I measured across the front, and I just kind of hacked this out. I've got 13 inches wide. And one quick way to figure out the golden ratio is to just multiply the shorter side by 1.618. And you will know the length of the other. So if I just hit up my calculator, I'm going to go to to the uh, 13 times 1.618, and I've got 21 inches, pretty much 0.03. We'll call it 21. Okay. Uh, so we got 13, and then check this out. I had this, this is 13 wide, and I just roughed it out, and I'm 21 inches long. It would just happen to be sitting there. Just magically is sitting there at the golden ratio. Wow. So this is actually... You're amazing. <laughs> Thanks, that was all for you to say that. That's all I live for. We just all want to be amazing, <laughs> just for a minute. All right, all right, back to real life again. Uh, this... This is actually it. So that's the relationship to or to the re rectangle. Now, my final door is actually, it's going to be pretty close because I'm going to cut it down a little to 20. Uh, when I cut this down, it'll be 12 and 3 quarters wide. And then the height of the door itself will be taken down to fit into the opening. And I will maintain the golden ratio, just for fun, okay? So you can change this when we do get our final cabinet door done. You could change it however you want, but let's make one with the golden ratio, just for fun. It's a nice, pleasing shape, you know? I mean, sometimes I think it's longer than it should be, but, but those cabinets, I think it'll be beautiful. So we're gonna stick with that. Mm. Steve says it's called the Fibonacci curve. Yeah, the Fibonacci curve, right. I was thinking about that, about the spiral. I knew I read that more in relationship to the Fibonacci curve, which it's just, it's crazy how many times it occurs in nature. Anybody suggest just there, if you know off the top of your head, other than the, the center of a uh, flower, uh, like a sunflower, um, I think it happens with pine cones, I'm not sure, but... Just really wild how that works. But anyway, here's my side. I've got, I'm 22 tall here, and our, across we're gonna be like 13 and three quarters for this one, I think. But this is, the, this is a, for the flat door. I'm changing it a little bit for the curve. So we'll be on the, We'll be on the uh, golden ratio for the for the curved door. All right, but anyway, this is 22 long, and for the front, now here's 
Here's the top. So you can see I've marked all the sides. We'd get into this in the class, but I've got the face on the outside. That's the top and the front. And here's the face on the side. So this is the left side. And the front is, toward, I mean, the, the face mark is to the top and toward the front. So I know that's the left side. So that's going to be oriented like this. So when I join these corners, this corner together, I want to join the dovetails like that so that I have that, that uh, pocket for the door to sit inside of, right? And then we'll radius that here. Now, we're not going to go flush with our dovetails on the end. We're going to add 3 16 So let me show you when, you, when you usually use a marking gauge to knife these out, I'll just grab one. I've got, I've got this already set to the three quarter inch dimension. So I'm using a marking gauge. I'm not gonna go into de great detail right now because it's not meant to build it so much as to go over the various construction techniques, you know? So there, I've got, my depth is three quarter. But now this one, I want it to go in, but then protrude another three sixteenths of an inch. So I set a second marking gauge with the three quarter plus that difference. And I already scribed along the top here. So I will get the pins to extend out. I won't worry about rounding them until they're all made, okay? All right, so here's where it gets fun. When you lay out dovetails, normally, You'd lay them out by hand, and I'd mark my corners and go ahead and, and mark the tails, basically, on this board. And then I'd be very careful when I'm sawing those out to saw 90 degrees front to back. If you saw 90 degrees, then you're going to have very little trouble fitting these together. Well, you know, as much as you can expect the first time, it's your first time. But you will have a much easier time of it if you knew that those first ones were 90 degrees. Now, when you're beginning, you don't always, and even after you've done it a while, you don't always, and it takes a little more fussing with to fit. But what if you could cut that first side and know absolutely certain, with certainty, you are 90 degrees, and you can do that on the table saw using the dovetail saw blades that are available for many places nowadays. Um, the ones I use are from Ridge Carbide. They're really nice. You can get them at any degree. Um, well, there's a certain range. I have a 10 degree and a 14 degree. The 14 gives you a stronger angle, which I like the look of, especially in softer woods. You want to go a little stronger in general. You can go the more subtle angles in harder wood and uh, you'll have a good result. So anyway, I'll show you that over at the, the table saw in a second. But in order to cut this, rather than laying them all out, I just cut a little quick template. And this I'd go over, you know, in the course or whatever, but I just cut, made a little template and I'm just gonna lay it on the end here. Get it kind of flush to the end. And all I need to do is draw a little line there there and there that's it that's all i need <laughs> just and i'm going to cut on that side of that line and that line over at the table saw so let's head over there and let's knock these out we got we've got 15 minutes to make a dovetail corner can we do it i think we can if we move wrong what's the angle you use for the hardwood tom Charles is asking. Uh, it right. can vary. Um, it, can, it can really be what you want. A lot of people use a 1-8. Um, you know, the 10 degree would be a little better, but uh, I have a dovetail gauge that has on one side 1-8, one which is a 1-inch rise over 8-inch length, and the other one is a 1-5, which is just a 1-inch rise over 5-inch length, and that's for softer woods. Um, so, all right, so now I'm at the table saw. Sorry, I might be talking loud, got my headphones on. <laughs> I'm gonna make this cut. So here's the beauty of this. I've got the 14 degree blade in there. It's already set. I adjusted the height on a piece of scrap so it just touched my knife line, 
which is three quarters up. And then I, you know, I tilted it at the 14 degrees. So all of the teeth are ground at the end with a 14 degree angle, every tooth, the same direction. So when you cut, the great, great thing about it is it leaves a flat bottom and it cuts right to the base of that. So here we go. All I have to do is put my line right on the curve and there, there I am. I'll get a nice cut there Then I'll hit that one. Then I'll clean up this whole one by sliding it all the way. Then I flip it around and once I make that first one, I can put a register mark on my, on my fence. So this first one, I don't even need a mark. I'll just look at my register mark, make that cut, and then I'll use the previous cut from the other side, sighting it on the gap so I slide it over. So my kerf at the bottom of these dovetails will be a little wider than the dovetail itself. So you can see this end. It's just going to be a little bit wider, see, than the kerf. And that'll give me a little more than a three quarter, I'm sorry, than a half inch at this end. So here we go, let's run it out. All right, let me get this out of the way. So, all we've got to do is clean out that middle. You can't really get it on this one because it's kind of a narrow piece. So you, you could go over to the bandsaw and nibble it away, but I'll just use, I'll just use the coping saw here. So I'll just drop it right in and cut across I don't want to get too low because I want to clean it up with a chisel down to the baseline okay and once I got that I need my half inch chisel which should fit in there really well and mallet and I'll just tap and now I'm just going to set the chisel right in the knife line which is convenient and I'm going to tap this down just go halfway so I don't blow out the other side and slightly undercut if you can and flip same thing oh, I left a lot over here right on the knife line. Beautiful. And last one. There you go. Now is that fast or what? We just cut out those tails in no time at all, like five minutes. And of course I already had it set up. <laughs> the old uh, Norm Abrams spiel. But, um, this, it really, it really didn't take me long at all to 
to cut these earlier. So once you have that side, now you have to transfer this shape to the other where it's going to meet to cut your pins. So we know, let's get this oriented correctly. Here's the face. Here's the top. So this is going to go right in here. I got to remember, I got to keep it registered back. So the back is flush to itself. So while I've got it like this, I'll just bring it up. And I'm going to set this in the, the vise. And I want to set this to the height. Let's get, there's my other. I'm just going to set it in and let's drop this down. I'll set it to the same thickness height. This is just more so that you can hold this easy. See, now I'll push that out. Now it's on there evenly. And let's make sure, okay, my face is over there. I want to be registering off the back. I just like to get this plum. Oh, wait, actually, I don't need that plum right now. Um, now I want to mark this. I've got to mark those shapes on the end grain. So I'm going to get a marking knife. It's like a flat back and bevels on this side. And then I'm going to bring this up. So I'm going to hold it and just slide this up. I'm using my square to give me a nice flush on the bottom. And then I'll bring that up. I can feel those pins slightly proud, which is about right because when I set the marking gauge, I just feel a little too proud. Let me set it back a touch. That's probably the same place, but whatever. Let's just go with it. I'm eyeing it, and it looks pretty good, so let's go with it. I'm going to hold now pressure. That's your light. <laughs> <laughs> the light is like right, right, under right. my armpit. Let me back up. All right, so I am going to use the uh, flat back to lean against that tail and knife right into the end grain. I just go right across. Sean's asking if you ever use a very shallow rebate to help with the alignment. Who? Sean. Sean? Yeah, that's a good question, Sean. I have used it in the past. There's certain situations where it's really helpful. But this isn't really one where I think it's worth it. Um, I prefer just to go with the full width or thickness of the material here. But there are times when that's an absolute value. This, this will go. Um, I like using the square. And I can, as long as it's square, I can see. I was looking down and I could see the light like coming through. So, all right. So now... I'm going to pull this off, and now I can see I've got nice lines there. I'm going to scribble on the material I want to take away. Don't get confused. You've got to do the scribble. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to just transfer these knife lines. I just want to make sure I got them coming around the corner. So I'll just quickly go like that, right around the corner. And now, this is an important step. You gotta square these lines down because this is gonna be your, your guide when you're sawing. You're gonna hand saw these. This is where it gets fun. So we put my pencil right in that little knife cut, slide the square up, and come right down. Same thing. It's more of a guide. The, really, the, the knife cut on the top is the most important, but this will help you to saw true as you're making the cut. This is kind of a long cut. I mean, it's an inch, just about an inch long. And Steve, Steve's asking, back when you were chiseling out, is it not best to sit on the side of the workpiece to see the vertical position of the chisel? Uh, well, you, yeah, you would be able to see that better, but you would have much less control sitting right in front, I mean, to me. Um, if you do it, you'll you'll you can actually feel when you're vertical. I've done it enough. After a while, you can feel it, and you can even check yourself with a little square. You know, hold your your uh, 
chisel against the wall that you just chiseled and see if you're plum or you want to slightly undercut. Okay, but, uh, but in practice, you're trying to do the most efficient, accurate thing you can. So it's just, it's a less of a step, like moving to the side and you can really feel it and you can move along faster if you're right in front of it. Uh, but you can try it both ways and see if you agree. All right, so now I'm going to set this in and clamp it. And here's where I wanted to get my square on. I like getting that square just to get it plumb. Even though I'm sawing to the line, it helps to just have everything as true as can be. Now, I'm going to use this little light because I hope it doesn't blow out your view but I can't see as good here right now. How's that? Is that all right? Somebody asked about your base on the Inca, so I'm just giving a little right? glimpse. Oh. <laughs> all right, well, let's get back to work. <laughs> all right, so this is the working. position. I've got, I can see my knife cuts. Now I'm gonna go ahead, now I gotta remember, I'm sawing on the rough, on the waist side, so the scribble side. I'm going to start off. I'm not going to go into this heavily right now because if we do this, we'll really cover it in the class. But I'm just letting the, the saw blade touch the knife line. I'm sawing as plumb as I can. That one wasn't as plumb as I can. <laughs> Once I get going... I go right with that saw cut. If I'm going to miss, I want it to drift into the waist because I can always true it up after. Okay, I got to step to my left. All right, same thing on the other side. Just get going here. And two more cuts. Tom, what do you want to say about how well uh, white paint, white pine stains? Is that? Oh, it's kind of tricky to stain white pine. Um, it's. Uh, I don't. I don't stain it enough to give you a recommendation on how, um, but it's tricky because of the way it absorbs stain. It's one of the harder woods, but if you do some practice, um, you might find that a, a real thin wash coat of shellac on it first will even it out if you do put stain on it. That's what I would recommend if I was testing, test first. Okay, so now I'm just sawing out those chunks between these pins. With the coping saw. I'm gonna go get on the other side. This is fun. This is, uh, I'm hey, almost done. Is your plane cambered? Yes, my, uh, my number five has a slight camber, which is a slight curve to the blade. And I go into that in that video of using a hand plane to smooth surfaces. Okay. Now I'm just going to flip. Um, that's good. Now I just need to chop down to that line. So I'm going to get back on my stool. And uh, I was using it. I had to kick you out of the stool. Sorry. That's how it goes around here. All right, so now I'm gonna sneak over to my seat. And again, here's that position again. So I'm gonna be taking, roughing it out close first. And then I'll go to the knife line. So I left about 30 seconds of an inch. Now I'm gonna set that baby right in the knife line. It's 
See that position right there? I know I'm at 90 or slightly undercutting it on the back. You just can feel it, feel it after a while. And if I'm not, I'll learn the hard way and have to cut it again. Rich says, um, how about a curved frame and a panel door? I think oh, maybe wow. a flat panel. <laughs> a curved frame and a flat panel Online door. Rolling. Oh, man. That's a good one, Richie. You should make that and show me. <laughs> no, I, that wouldn't be that bad. I think if I'm understanding, you'd have like a little belly in the, on the sides. Like, okay, now I'm going to flip. So this goes nicely. I mean, if this was harder wood, it would be... It'd take a little longer, you know? It'd be a little harder. <laughs> I'm just asking what your opinion is on um, Mike Pekovich's blue tape for scribbing, scribing pins. Oh, it works great. I mean, it's a great way to go about it. I mean, um, it's a great visual aid, I think, especially if you're starting out and you need to, and you want to, really be able to see the negative space like it it tells you right away that that's what you want to leave behind you know but um i'm so used to doing it old school that the knife i can see the knife and i just scribble so it's sort of like you know once you're used to it a while you might want to try without the blue tape and see if it helps, sometimes on really dark woods like Wenge, it's hard to see the knife line. So using a blue tape or something like that is uh, helpful. And it's, it's really a great method where you can, you can see absolutely what you're shooting for. But when you get a good knife line, you, you're getting the same thing. You're just looking at the knife line instead of the edge of the tape. So it's kind of like just something you can get used to. Um, and I would just, I'd recommend trying it without after a while, but absolutely, that's a great method for understanding and learning how to cut them. What are your thoughts about chisel mallets versus hammers, son? Um, I like the round mallet. The hammer is good, but it only gives you a small spot to hit like if you're really good with a hammer like you're very familiar with it no problem but with a mallet like this you don't have to look at it you're like up in space and because it's round there's something about that you get a really all the force gets generated right onto that um you get really accustomed to this it's got a heavy head on it so you can i just find you can really control it well even for carving um you know but there are the other square-headed mallets that people use a lot, too. I just start out with that round-headed, and I really like it. Every, every wood carver I've ever seen uses a... The ones I've known have used a round-head mallet. It just delivers like an even blow, like all that force gets hit right in there. So now I can sight this way and make sure if I kind of missed anything, you know, on my saw down, if I went off the line a little, I can just tweak it and true it up. But there, there's no tape there, but um, let's see how it fits. All right, so this is the top and that's it. So this is the one. So usually I put it in this way, and this is pretty, it's pretty nice to fit together. And there you go. Look at that. See? No, no. Without the tape, you can get a really good result. Look at even those look pretty sweet. And when you put the glue on this, it it swells even more. So it looks so locked in. It's awesome. Now look how that nice proud dovetail is. Let's give that just a quick little treatment, see if we can approximate a roundover just on this one corner. Then we'll put the whole thing together 
and call it a night. Let's we'll see how it looks. Sorry about that. All right, so when I do this, I want to mark the center line. This is the apex of the curve. Just kind of eyeballing it like this, right down the middle. And then I could eyeball my 3 16ths over here. Okay, I don't want to go beyond that. It's a little less, but don't you think that's a little less than 3 16ths? Pretty confident of that, yeah. <laughs> if I just leave that line, we'll be good. Okay, so now I'm going to make that little radius. Now, here I have not tried this on white pine, so well, let's see what happens. I'm going to use the, if I use a, a low angle block plane, this one set kind of fine. Let's go with this one set heavier. Now, I'm coming up on it like this so I don't split it out. If I went right off that end, that would get a fracture on that end. So let's just go like this. Just facet this. Now I'm gonna, I can bring it a little lower. See, I'm getting a little fracture right there, but. Last time I did this, it was on the ash cabinet and it went, it worked really well. But you gotta be careful about it fracturing over. So, let me see how, oh, I'm doing pretty good for time. I'm almost done. Now I could work that longer. I don't wanna go crazy on it right now, but let's just do the other side really fast, a little faster. I'm gonna use a rasp on it in a second. So this is kind of like roughing it out. That's the new uh, light that we bought at Harbor Freight, right? Uh, that, that's the one that we got from that class. That's oh. not the new one. That's, so it's working now? Yeah, um, Dean told me he was having the same trouble with his light and he had a really, it was a really complicated fix. He said, <laughs> just tighten the battery cap at the bottom. Eh. And it worked fine. <laughs> so if anybody has that way, it won't stay on. You are you could just be loose down there, there at the go. cap. Steve, maybe that's it. That was my problem. Did Steve have that problem? He was asking if that was a new one or you had fixed your other one. Oh, yes, I got fixed. I did actually get a new one that is fixed. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't have the bendy top to it, but. All right, so let me just, I'm gonna bring over the Nicholson 50. This'll finish it off. Well, I'd go to a file after this, but. Just always kind of working into the tooth so you don't break it off the edge. Let me turn this around. Same thing. That one's breaking off a little bit, but I'm not gonna worry about it at the moment. So do we end up with a top two door styles? Mm, that's a pretty the solid vast, coopered. Uh, request of all three. I think I'll have to make an executive decision. Find a happy... I'll have to make an executive decision. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so um, this is, I would use a file on it then, but let's just see if I go right to 150 paper, if I can 
make it look finished. Yeah, this, this white pine is very agreeable. I won't get it the whole way, but it'll give us a, an approximation. So then what you need to do is like knock the edges down too. So these will get softened like that. And it makes it more tactile, you know, like it's almost, it's not like faceting a uh, craftsman style peg, but it, you do want to soften those edges and everything will have a really nice proud joinery appearance. Okay, so let's, that feels better already. Let's see how that looks. I didn't go all the way to the line, but we'll get an approximation here. This is the one we just cut. Now we've modified it. Check that out. Pretty sweet, huh? Very sweet. Camera lady likes it. Is that going to be mine? <laughs> yeah, it's either on the right or the left of the bathroom, nice. the double sinks. That's great. You're on the right, so that would be yours. Okay. Actually, that one won't show if we put it on the right. So Anyway, all right, so let's just pop the other sides in and see if we get... I might have to do a little fitting of the door, but it should go pretty quickly. Here's the bottom. Now that's the face, so that's actually outside. So that's going to go right in here. And then we flip. While you do that, I'm going to give Ramsey another look at your base. It's all very, dusty. It's very dusty. From the sanding I've been doing. Okay, come on back over here. Okay. Just another glimpse. Others have asked about that too, so. Okay. okay. All right. So then we fit that in. And there you go. That's all in. Now we've got a, we would radius this to the door, but I think this is a little smaller than the door is, so I might have to quickly joint the door. Let's see. Yeah, it's just a little touch long. I'm not going to change the saw blade, so I'm going to go over to the joiner and give it a quick pass on each end. Here we go. Okay, let's see what that did. Does that fit? Oh, not quite. Let me, one more time. Be right back. huh so then it goes in there I need to adjust that a little but you can see how the flat body cabinet is that's oh, pretty nice. sweet huh so nice so you add like this depth and character on the side and then you have the raised panel on the front with the classic pegged mortise and tenons 
simple little cabinet to make because it's just top and two sides and then of course the back would actually get rabbited in so I'd run a rabbit on the sides before assembling and then I would run a stopped rabbit on the top and bottom so that gives me that recess for the back panel to set in now for the back panel I'd probably use a ply or uh, you could use a solid back but you could ship lap it but I'm gonna use just like a quarter inch thick back maybe five sixteenths and then a, a thin French cleat to go on the wall that this will actually hang on on the wall they're super strong but we'll get into that later I just want you to see whoops <laughs> the final result <laughs> so we've got the the flat version and let's get the curved version up next to it this is the this is not the stronger curve but it's the door that fits so we've got our this is our veneered curve and then of course we have the other option which will be the Krenov version solid Cooper door so but we're gonna treat the the box the same way we're gonna use those proud signature rounded over dovetails I, I just kind of made that up I, I'm sure somebody else has done it at some point but I never saw anybody else do it <laughs> whoops whoops so then we make another that door <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if it's fine. I'm kidding. Tom, uh, what, Brian. What did, say that, that, what did you say that was mine? I said that was yours. <laughs> no, I, it's fine. It's, um, hey, it's made well. I have a question. Brian says, would it work to put first put the round over shape on the ends of the top and bottom and then cut the pins? Um, it'd be really hard. Who said it, Brian? Brian. Brian, that'd be really tough because once you round it, then it's hard to knife accurately because you're going to be knifing away. You're going to be holding that end on there. So I don't, I couldn't figure out how to do it that way. Um, there may be another way you could round it. Um, it's hard to do. You can't really do it on a router. But we might think of something else. That's a good suggestion, but it's just it's just too hard to knife accurately and then to saw across. You're gonna be sawing on a radius end. It's gonna be tricky. You could try it. I would I do a little mock-up. I always cut extra parts to experiment with things like that. And you round over the top, right? Round off the top, right? Round off what? Round off the top. The top? I think the edge. Of the front, remember you're around? I don't know. Oh, the front edge, yeah. The right, Top correct. Of the cabinet, sorry. Yeah, this gets radius here. Now you could set up a slight um, router bit if you have one that ha that matches that, or you could just do it by hand, which is pretty easy on something like this. And hinges? What are you thinking about hinges? Hinges is a lot of ways to go. Um, here you could use a knife hinge. I've got a little. I thought of this we got hinge options over here so you can use something like a knife hinge I haven't figured out which style would be best on here but these are like near invisible these are the kind that Krenoff always used so I think on the final cabinet we'll probably use a knife hinge and then you also have these butt hinges that you could use they'd be in here though they'd be on the edge so they wouldn't be on the front which would be kind of nice. They wouldn't be seen really on one side. The barrel, the barrel of the butt hinge would be right here. So something like this. That door doesn't want to stay there. But Michael's asking, would you wrap it after assembly on the router table? No stopped rabbits. You can do it that way, Michael. Yep, I've done it that way. Um, that that's almost faster. But you could also um, do it before hand as well but yeah that's yeah. that's a good way to do it Warren's suggesting maybe a instead of a race panel how about a mirror on the door sorry a what rather than a race panel maybe a mirror oh yeah you could do a mirror version too sure um but this is the other hinge that we were gonna use and that 
that would be on the edge here. The barrel would be just as slightly exposed on this edge here and here. And then when you open it though, you will see the leaves of the hinges. You'll see it there and here. So it would swing open like that. So that's another way to go. It's pretty invisible, especially if you're going to have it in a place where we're planning to have it, where it won't be, you're not going to see that one side and you're going to want to open the near side like that. So it could be either and hinge. You mentioned using a French cleat for hanging, right? Yes. Yeah, that's how I would draw it up. And that would be in the course. We'd talk about the, the French cleat. So everybody likes this, huh? Yeah, you like this project? Yeah, we're looking forward to the plans. So you're going to... I think it would be a Work sweet project. Soon? Yes, I am. I'm working on this and a couple other projects as well. Hey, difference between a file and a rasp, John is asking. Um, a rasp is just a more coarse version, pretty much. But a rasp also has individual teeth, um, like, punched out. Like, this, this nice Nicholson rasp I have has a random tooth pattern. Um, but they're they're like little teeth sticking out where a file has grooves cut so it's a it's a softer cutting action it tends to be think of it almost like finer sandpaper to go to a file af after a rasp the rasp more aggressive and those random teeth rasps like the nicholson are wonderful for shaping curves and you know, use a lot with 18th century furniture, curved legs, and things like that. So, okay. All right, everybody. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I sure did. I'm eager and excited to get started on my hanging cabinet and a lot of nice techniques to be used with this. And I really like the way it turned out in the pine. It's nice and e it's yeah, easier, too. Great. So, um, hey, if you like this content, remember to like, share, and subscribe. We love it to see you subscribe. And also um, to connect with us at our, at our website at epicwoodworking.com if you really want to get on the inside. And don't forget, if you want to be part of that epic weekend, check that out for September. The air is getting snappy out there, and it gets incredibly beautiful here in New England that time of year. We only have a couple spots so don't delay. They go fast. And anyway, that's it for this week. Thanks for hanging out with us. On yes. behalf of the camera lady and myself, we look forward to seeing you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. So I appreciate you joining us.